Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Jess Lenore in Baltimore. In a move that's shocked and angered many around the world, Trump's EPA head, Scott Pruitt, took aim at the scientific consensus over what's causing climate change, recently telling CNBC that carbon dioxide is not a main contributor. Here's what he said. Do you believe that it's been proven that CO2 is the primary control knob for climate? Do you believe that? No, I, no, I think that, that measuring with precision uh, human activity on the climate is something very challenging to do, and there's tre tremendous disagreement about the, the degree of impact. Uh, so, so, no, I would not agree uh, that it's a primary contributor uh, to, the, to the global warming that we see. Okay. All right, but we don't know that yet. Now joining us to discuss this is Dr. Alan Robach. He's a distinguished professor of climate science, the Department of Environmental Sciences at Rutgers University. Thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. So we want to get into the science of this, but first, your response to Pruitt, he has deep ties to the fossil fuel industry, and uh, you know he's been a fierce opponent of environmental regulation as the Oklahoma Attorney General. Well, he's absolutely wrong. He's not a scientist like I am and like all my colleagues are. We've known that carbon dioxide traps energy, that it's a greenhouse gas for 100 years. And we've been able to measure that precisely. And we've been ever able to measure its effect on climate change. And most of the warming of the last 50 years is caused by the additional carbon dioxide and, and a few other greenhouse gases that humans have put into the atmosphere. There's no other way to explain the warming that we've seen. And we wanted to just start with the basic chemistry. Talk about what carbon dioxide is and what about the chemical structure of the molecule makes it heat trapping, or in other words, a greenhouse gas? Carbon dioxide is a carbon atom and two oxygen atoms, and they're in a row. And so when heat energy hits them, they start vibrating. And they can vibrate like this, they can move around, and they can wiggle up and down. And this vibration that is induced by their absorbing the energy from the heat uh, makes them move around faster and they bounce into the, all the other molecules in the atmosphere, mainly nitrogen and oxygen, and warm them up. Then they can emit heat energy by slowing down their vibrations and some of that emission goes out to outer space and some of it comes back down to Earth. And that additional emission from carbon dioxide uh, is what traps the heat, is what increases the amount of energy at the surface. There's another important greenhouse gas, which is water, H2O. It also has three atoms in the molecule. And there's a lot more water in the atmosphere than carbon dioxide. And water is actually the most important greenhouse gas. But the concentration of water in the atmosphere is controlled by the atmosphere, by the climate system. If there's too much water, it rains. If it's too dry, evaporation puts more water into the atmosphere. So the relative humidity tends to stay relatively constant. And when you warm the climate by trapping more heat with carbon dioxide, that puts more water in the atmosphere and that makes it even warmer still. That's called a positive feedback. The relative humidity stays the same, but that's the amount of water, the absolute humidity goes up because the temperature is warmer. So this is very well understood and it's not controversial at all. There's no question about that. And can you talk but, about how it's produced naturally and why it's a byproduct of fossil fuel consumption? Well, fossil fuel is coal and oil and natural gas, and those are called hydrocarbons. They're mainly made up of hydrogen and carbon. When you burn them, you mix oxygen with them, and that produces water, H2O, and carbon dioxide, CO2. These two gases are the result of combustion. So every time you drive your car, every time you turn on gas to cook your food, it puts CO2 and, and water vapor into the atmosphere. As I explained, the water uh, is controlled by the atmosphere, but half of the CO2 remains for a long time, thousands of years, and builds up in the atmosphere. And we can measure that very precisely. We've been measuring it in Hawaii at Mauna Loa since 1957, 1959, I think. So uh, we had this long record of it going up and up and up and up and up. To further answer yeah. your question, you asked about the natural cycle. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, when it's spring now in the Northern Hemisphere and so all the flowers you're seeing outside, all the leaves, all the food that's about to be grown is carbon. It's being taken out of the atmosphere by photosynthesis 
and that's driving down the concentration of CO2. In the fall, when these things decay, the CO2 goes up. So there's a seasonal cycle. And the seasonal cycle of the carbon puts about 100 petagrams of carbon to the atmosphere every year and takes 100 out. Humans put about nine in per year. So we have 109 going in, but only about 104 comes out. So about five petagrams every year stays in the atmosphere. It's not taken up by the ocean. It's not taken up by more vegetation. And that's what's causing global warming. And uh, Pruitt also talked about how CO2 levels are measured. Can you, can you explain this to us as well? Well, we have chemical reactions. We suck the CO2 in, the air in, and we measure its concentration. And this is well-known chemistry. It's been done for you know, a long, long time. And as I said, it's been done at Mauna Loa for more than 50 years. And so it's very precise. And there are three other baseline observatories that the U.S. government operates, one in Point Barrow, Alaska, one in Guam, and one at the South Pole and they've been measuring it. And then we take flask samples and take them to laboratories and measure them. So the amount around the world is very well known and it goes up and down at different latitudes, different amounts in the Southern hemisphere. There's not much land in the mid latitude. So the seasonal cycle is weaker and it's inverted. The amount in the Northern hemisphere is higher than in the Southern hemisphere because most of the sources, most of the emissions are in the Northern hemisphere. And so we can measure the difference, and they're both going up, but it's going. But th there's a difference, and the difference tells us how long it takes the atmosphere to mix, how long it takes the carbon dioxide put in in the northern hemisphere to drift down into the southern hemisphere. So this is all very well known. There's no controversy about it at all. And finally, you know, by challenging this, the consensus, uh, Pruitt is able to justify um, removing uh, some of the regulations that. Uh, that were enacted under, under the Obama administration. What impact could this have um, for the future of the planet? You know, there's three fundamental questions about, about this. One is, how will the climate change if we continue to put greenhouse gases in? The other is, how will it affect us? And the third is what we should do about it. As a scientist, I can answer the first two. Clearly, putting more greenhouse gases in causes global warming. How it will affect us there are winners and losers. There are people that are now doing shipping through the Arctic Ocean. They're winners. There are people that continue to sell CO, sell uh, fossil fuels. Uh, they they uh, uh, are continuing to make a profit. Uh, most of the impacts, however, are negative, averaged over the planet. Sea level is rising. There'll be stronger storms. There'll be more floods and droughts, and there'll be impacts on our food and water supply. What we should do about it is a value judgment. As a scientist, I can't tell you what to do about it. Everybody makes their own decision based on their own values, what they, uh, based on their own investments and so forth. And so there are people that continue to make a lot of money with business as usual, continuing to sell products that dump CO2 into the atmosphere, using it as a sewer and not paying any sewer charges. And they make money from it. So they want to continue doing that. So the people that sell you coal and oil and and natural gas. And that's that's and they have a lot of money and they give a lot of money to politicians and that's where we are. All right, Dr. Alan Robach, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for joining us at the Real News Network.